Hi everyone, how you all doing? I hope you've all had a good week and recovered from last week's case because bloody hell. And unfortunately, today's case is another heavy one. I'm really sorry. I mean, to be honest, all of these cases are very heavy in their own way, aren't they? But there's definitely some that creep you out more than others. And today's case is very creepy. It has creeped me out so much because today we are going to be talking about the case of Jeffrey Maxwell and he Oh God, he is just the worst. He's creepy, he's creepy as hell. So Jeffrey Maxwell was a sexual sadist. There is no other way to describe him. He was evil, creepy and cruel. And for some reason, he was just able to get away with it for years. Are, are these things that that you're wanting to, to try on somebody? I mean, guess a little bit of fantasy. Remember the case of Cameron Hooker who abducted Colleen Stan and locked her in a box for seven years whilst sexually torturing her? Well, today's case is kind of like that. And the main victim in today's case is a woman called Lois Pearson. And she went through absolute hell. She was literally tortured for a significant period of time, which is probably anyone's worst nightmare. Oh, and there's also a very good chance that Jeffrey Maxwell is also a serial killer. Yeah, I'm just gonna drop that on you right now. Possibly a serial killer as well as a sexual sadist. But somehow Jeffrey managed to fly under the radar. There is literally no coverage of this case online. And I can't believe it. So there is a real good chance that you've probably never heard of this case, which is unbelievable when you find out what he has done. But that is what we're gonna get into today. So let's jump in. So I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get delicious recipes with fresh ingredients delivered right to your door every single week. And it just takes the stress out of planning what to have at meal times. It is just so incredible. And I have been using HelloFresh regularly every single week for, oh my God, well over a year now. And I truly don't know what I would do without HelloFresh. I just don't know how I used to plan for dinners every night. How did I do that? With the recipes, there is so much variety. There's quick and easy options, calorie smart options, family friendly options. Plus they also have their fast and fresh options, which are ready in less than 15 minutes, which is truly a lifesaver on a busy day. Also, you can choose over 100 items to add in on top of your meals from easy lunches to snacks to desserts. And if you guys are ever adding any extras, I highly recommend the garlic bread because oh my God, it is so delicious. Also the recipe that I am showing you this week, the creamy truffle and mushroom pasta. Oh my God. That is my favorite recipe hands down from HelloFresh. When ever that recipe comes up, I always add it into my box. If you like creamy truffle pasta, you have to try this recipe. All ingredients come pre-portioned and in their own little brown bags. So you can literally just pull out your brown bag and pull out your fridge items and just get cooking. There is also a recipe card for each meal included in your box, which does have pictures and it just makes it so easy to follow along. And HelloFresh meals are always so delicious. I am never disappointed with any meals from them. There is less prep, less cleanup and less food waste, which is obviously super important. And also HelloFresh is on average 25% cheaper than takeout. And it can even be cheaper than your weekly grocery shopping, which just really helps because everything is so expensive nowadays. And if you guys wanted to try out HelloFresh for yourself, go to hellofresh.com and use the code 16Danielle for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com and use the code 16Danielle for 16 free meals plus free shipping. And if you use my code, that really does help out this channel. So it would mean a lot to me if you're going to HelloFresh anyway. So thank you again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Jeffrey Allen Maxwell was born on the 12th of July, 1952, making him a cancer. He grew up in the Fort Worth area of Texas. And this is where the majority of today's case takes place. And that is literally all I know about Jeffrey's childhood. I don't know the name of his parents. I don't know if he had any siblings. I don't know what his school life was like. Did he even go to school? Was he bullied? Was there trauma? There are only two things that I know about his childhood. Number one, he grew up in a very strict religious household and it was very strict, quite overbearing at times. And then the second thing that we know about Jeffrey's childhood is that when he was a teenager, he would break into neighbors' homes and steal women's dirty underwear. Yeah. And that is all he would steal. He wouldn't steal money, jewelry, any valuables. No, he wasn't interested in that. He just wanted women's underwear. 
And there were occasions when Jeffrey was clearly at a friend's house and they were sat around the dinner table having dinner. He would excuse himself and say, oh, I need to go and use the bathroom. But then he would actually go and rummage to try and find dirty laundry to find dirty women's underwear, which is just creepy as hell. Like I said, Jeffrey is a creep and it definitely makes you worry about the kind of people you could be inviting over for dinner. And in the end, Jeffrey stole between 30 and 40 pairs of knickers and he just would have these knickers lying around his bedroom so god knows where his parents were because why were they not questioning this so that is pretty much all we know about jeffrey's life until he turns 18 and then we do start to know a little bit more because at this point he meets a woman called rita and they quickly marry and I think they quickly marry because she falls pregnant and they settle down into like a little domestic lifestyle and everything seemed to be going great for the family. There was no red flags, nothing, nothing to be suspicious of. But then Jeffrey and Rita got divorced just like that very quickly. And Rita actually does pop back up in this story. So don't forget her. So Jeffrey recently divorced. It is now 1981. He is currently 29 years old. And this is when a very significant thing happens because he meets a woman called Martha Martinez. Martha was also 29 years old. She was currently living in Mexico with her family and they actually met through a postal matching service which I didn't even know that things like this existed because obviously it's 1981. There is no such thing as online dating right now so yeah there was a postal matching service who would have thought? So Jeffrey and Martha met through this postal matching service. And for the majority of their relationship, it was just love letters, like going between the two of them. And they soon hit it off. Martha fell head over heels in love with Jeffrey from these love letters, which I know sounds like a rom-com, doesn't it? It sounds so sweet, but um, in this case, it's not sweet at all. So because she was living in Mexico, Jeffrey soon started to actually drive and see her. And after only a few visits, Jeffrey asked Martha, Martha to marry him. Now, Martha was overwhelmed by this. I mean, she had fallen in love with Jeffrey, but this was so quick. And she immediately said yes. However, there was one problem. Her family did not like Jeffrey at all. Whenever he had visited them, he just really creeped them out. You know, there's just some people where they don't actually have to do anything. You just get that feeling and you want to avoid them. Well, that is the kind of vibe that Jeffrey was giving out. So when Martha's family found out that she was engaged to him, they were devastated because they could see that there was something not quite right with Jeffrey. And they didn't want Martha to be getting involved with him any more than she already was. But Martha was very vulnerable. She had pretty much no self-esteem. She thought that no one else would love her. She would never be able to find anybody else. She had no confidence. And Jeffrey, he definitely played on this. And Martha's family knew this about Martha and they begged her, please, Martha, don't marry him. But Martha didn't listen. It's just so sad. She felt like she couldn't find anyone better. And she ignored her family's pleas and she got married to Jeffrey. And she soon moved to Texas. And unfortunately for Martha, everything would go downhill from here. So when Martha first moved in with Jeffrey, their relationship became sexual. And Jeffrey's sexual interests did not align with Martha's sexual interests. Jeffrey had a very large collection of books on bondage. And just to give you a few of the titles of some of the books that he owned, there was one called Bound and Whipped, another called Bondage for Three Wives, and then the troubling one, he had a book called Caged Schoolgirls. I'm sorry, no. No, 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 no one should be able to have a book that is called Caged Schoolgirls. I'm sorry, no. Now, Martha, when she saw Caged Schoolgirls, she should have been running for the hills, but she didn't. She stayed. She, like I said, was very vulnerable. And it wasn't long until Jeffrey started to force Martha to participate in his sexual fantasies. Now in the beginning she did agree to participate and Jeffrey soon started using handcuffs on her and chains and whips as well as cords and clothespins which I didn't actually know what a clothespin was so I googled it and for those of you watching in the UK it's just a peg. 
a peg. You know, a peg that you use for the washing line. So in the beginning, all of this was consensual, somewhat, because it was a bit of a blurry line because Martha, she did consent, but she was coerced into participating in things that she didn't want to, that she wasn't comfortable with. And I just want to say that there is nothing wrong with bondage. I'm not saying that, but it needs to be two consenting adults taking part. And Martha, she did kind of express that she didn't want to be doing this. She wasn't comfortable. So Jeffrey would force himself on her. And he became very aggressive and controlling. And it wasn't long until Martha found herself tied up, chained up, and she would be repeatedly whipped and beaten. And she didn't consent to any of this. There was one point that he even used a stun gun on her and Martha would be absolutely covered in cuts and bruises. And on some occasions, Jeffrey would even lock Martha in a room on her own in the dark for days at a time. And what just makes this just so much worse is that he would use this as punishment as well. He would sexually assault her as punishment. If they had an argument, he would punish her. And what is just so sick is that after he would punish her, Jeffrey would love bomb her, which is just so typical for abusers, isn't it? He would charm her, he would brainwash her, he would actually blame her for her punishment, saying that it was her fault. And my Martha almost was brainwashed. She was completely under his spell, which is just so heartbreaking. And to make things just a million times worse is that Martha and Jeffrey had a child together. I don't exactly know when they had a child, but they had a child at some point. So can you imagine what kind of things that child is being exposed to? So things carry on like this for a while. Literally years roll by and nothing is getting any better for Martha. And whenever Martha would go back to Mexico to visit her family, her family would see all of the cuts and the bruises all over her body. And they would know that it was Jeffrey that was doing this. But whenever she was asked about the bruises, she would just completely shut down. She would not want to talk about it. But things just keep getting worse, worse and worse. So Jeffrey and Martha were invited to a family wedding. The family member was a part of Martha's family. And whilst at the wedding, Jeffrey forced himself on the bride. He actually went up to the bride and said, seeing as we're family now, I guess I can do this. And then he went on to kiss her. And this wasn't just like a peck on the cheek or like, you know, anything like that. This was a full on tongue kiss everything. And as you can imagine, everyone at that wedding was mortified. But this was not just a one-off thing either because there was another wedding a few months later and Jeffrey did the exact same thing again. And very sadly, things are only going to get worse for Martha. So we now get to 1987. This is six years after they met. Jeffrey is now 35 years old. And on Sunday, the 16th of April, things escalate dramatically because on this day Jeffrey and Martha had had a huge argument and they did argue quite a lot but this one was a particularly big argument and Jeffrey told Martha that she would pay for this. Now after the argument Martha fell asleep on the sofa and when she woke up she found that her hands were bound behind her back with duct tape and there was also duct tape over her mouth. Following this Jeffrey appeared and dragged her to the bedroom room where he sexually tortured her, which included placing a clamp on her nipples that gave her electric shocks. Afterwards, Jeffrey forced Martha to drink this little cocktail that he had made, which was alcohol, painkillers, and sleeping pills. And then she completely blacked out. And honestly, this next bit, I just cannot believe this actually happened because hours later, Martha was discovered by police on the side of the road, which was the I-35 in Texas. And when they found her, she was completely beaten and bruised. Her hands were still bound. But what is just completely unbelievable is that when the police found Martha, her throat had been slit. Yes, her throat had been slit from ear to ear, completely slit. She was covered in blood. She had lost so much blood. It is 
amazing that she's actually still conscious because she is. She's struggling to open her eyes, but she's still alive, which I cannot believe. They rushed Martha to hospital and after undergoing surgery and intensive treatment, Martha survived. What the hell? I cannot even believe that happened. I am so glad that she survived, but what the hell? And the police asked her, what the hell happened? The last thing she remembers is that she had an argument with her husband. She went to sleep and when she woke up, she was tied up. He sexually assaulted her. He then drugged her and she passed out. She doesn't remember anything after that. So the police rush over to Jeffrey's house and when they get there, Jeffrey acts dumb. Yeah, when the police officers say, what the hell did you do to your wife? Jeffrey is just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But the police search the premises and they come across all of his very concerning books. They also found some torture devices and the nipple clamps and they arrested him immediately and charged him with aggravated kidnapping. However, the problem was is that they didn't find a weapon. They didn't find the knife or the instrument used to slit Martha's throat. There was also no traces of blood found on the premises. So wherever he did slit her throat, it was clearly off the property. And Jeffrey was being held in jail awaiting trial. And when he was in jail, he started writing Martha letters, started manipulating her again. And in the end, after all of these letters, Martha stopped cooperating with the police. So eventually the case did go to trial. But when it did, Martha refused to testify. And because she refused to testify, and because the police did lack crucial pieces of physical evidence, a grand jury refused to indict him on the charges. So he was allowed to walk. No charges, nothing. And it's just crazy that Jeffrey attempted to murder his wife, Martha, because let's not beat around the bush there. You do not slit someone's throat unless you want to kill them. But Jeffrey managed to manipulate his way out of this one. So after this brutal attack, Martha finally left Jeffrey. She packed up her things and went back to Mexico. But was Jeffrey about to let Martha go that easily? Of course not. Jeffrey started writing her love letters and he started to manipulate her once again. He would say in these letters, oh Martha, I'm so sorry, I need you back, I want you back. But he also started to say that God wanted them back together as well. He was playing on the fact that Martha was very religious. She was a devout Catholic. He also started blaming her for the attack saying that it was her fault that he slit her throat. I mean, he didn't exactly use those words because he wasn't admitting to slitting her throat, but you know what I mean. He was completely gaslighting her, turning everything around, manipulating her reality. And Martha's family pleaded with her to not pay attention to these letters, ignore them. She was better off without him. But sadly, in the end, Martha was still under his spell and she went back to him. Now, at first, everything seemed to be okay. Things were good for the couple, but that is always the way, isn't it, with manipulators and abusers. They trick you into thinking that everything is okay and that they've changed, but they don't. But in the beginning, things were kind of normal. Martha went to college. Their son started to attend school and he seemed pretty happy. And another five years pass. So then we get to 1992 and things are not going great anymore, unfortunately, because Jeffrey didn't hide who he was. He made it pretty clear to everyone that he was a bad person. So people in the community had started to notice that he abused his wife. It is also said that he bullied and mentally abused their son, who was 10 years old at this point. And also something else happened in 1992, and that was that Martha went missing. So on Mother's Day, Martha's family received a letter from Martha. And in the letter, Martha had said she was leaving Jeffrey for good. And she was also leaving her son. And she was going away for a bit and she wouldn't be in contact for a very long 
time. Sounds suspicious? Well, of course it's bloody suspicious. So there were a few suspicious things about these letters. First of all, Martha didn't send letters. That was Jeffrey's thing. Whenever Martha would get in contact with her family, she would just pick up the phone. The second strange thing is that these letters were written in English. Now, Martha always wrote everything in Spanish. That was her first language. Why all of a sudden would she start writing in English? But then the most suspicious thing about these letters is that Martha had said that she was leaving her son behind. Now her family knew that this was not possible. Martha adored her son. She would never leave her son with that abuser, Jeffrey. So Martha's family knew straight away that there was something fishy going on and Martha probably didn't write these letters. So Martha's family went straight to Texas where Jeffrey and Martha were living at the time. I'm not 100% sure where they were living, which is why I just say Texas, but they went straight to the police to report Martha missing. And after the police learned what Jeffrey had probably done to Martha before, i.e. slit her throat, the police jumped straight into action and went straight to Jeffrey's home. Now, when they questioned Jeffrey at his home, they said, where's your wife? Where has she gone? Jeffrey again just started acting dumb. He was like, I don't know where she's gone. She left me. They did search the premises again and they couldn't find one single shred of evidence to suggest that Jeffrey was behind the disappearance of Martha. However, inside the home, they did find Martha's purse, which contained her money, her car keys, and her passport. So the police knew that without her purse, without these belongings, especially her passport and her car, she has no money, she could not have gone very far. And the police knew that Jeffrey Maxwell was probably behind this, but they just couldn't prove it. Sadly now, Martha was just a another missing person and she would remain missing for years and this is just so sad and we do actually revisit Martha at the end of this case. So we now get to 1995. Jeffrey is currently 43 years old and Martha has been missing for three years years. And unfortunately, I don't know what happened to their son because obviously Martha had left her son behind, but he's not currently with Jeffrey. And I just truly hope that he went back to Mexico to live with his family. So at this point, three years after Martha went missing, Jeffrey files for divorce on the grounds that she is missing and not coming back. And not long after his divorce, he remarries his first wife, Rita. Yes, I told you that Rita was going to come back up. So remember that Jeffrey also has a child with Rita. Well, Rita in a different relationship had three more children. And don't ask me why she decided to get married to Jeffrey. I can only assume that she is also a victim of Jeffrey. He is also manipulating and abusing her because why would anyone want to get married to Jeffrey? However, two days before the wedding, Rita's best friend went to the police to report a rape. And who was the accused in the rape? Well, that was Jeffrey. But Jeffrey never got prosecuted for this assault. I don't know if there was a lack of evidence or anything like that, but unfortunately, rapes do go unprosecuted a lot of the time. But Jeffrey has gotten away with it again. And it's just crazy when I sit here and I think about how much he has already gotten away with. So after Jeffrey and Rita get remarried, they move in together and the problems keep on mounting. So Rita's middle daughter, she put in a complaint at her school that her stepdad was inappropriately touching her. It's just like, what the hell? This poor girl said that this would constantly happen when she was playing Nintendo. Jeffrey would come and sit next to her and just be really creepy. He would try and kiss her. He would try and put his tongue in her mouth and she would try and block his tongue with her teeth. And it's just absolutely disgusting. Jeffrey is really just the worst. Now the school got in touch with Rita and Jeffrey about these complaints, but was anything ever done about it? No, because Jeffrey just pulled her out of school and he made all three of Rita's daughters move to a different school. However, when the children get to this new school, her youngest daughter, so not the middle daughter anymore, the youngest daughter makes a complaint at that school that her stepdad has inappropriately touched her. It's just like, what? 
the hell. So in this situation, the younger daughter, she couldn't sleep. I think she had a nightmare or something and she woke up in the middle of the night and she went into her mom's bedroom looking for her mom to comfort her. But her mom wasn't there. Jeffrey was there. And Jeffrey told her to come over to him, come closer. And he just started groping her. Now, this time when the younger daughter complained to the school that her stepdad had inappropriately touched her, this school didn't go to the parents. They went straight to CPS. And CPS arrived at the home and ordered Rita to remove her children from this situation and move away from Jeffrey, which thankfully, Rita did. Thank God she got her children out of that situation. However, did Jeffrey ever face charges for this sexual assault on the two children? Of course he didn't. This was another thing that he got away with. So now we get to 2001. This is six years after he remarried Rita, who he obviously is no longer with. And he is now approaching his 50s. And this is when he moves out to a property in Parker County, Texas. And almost immediately when he moved to this new area, he became a problem to the local residents. And whenever neighbors would pass him, they would be nice, they would be friendly, they would wave, they would say hi, but Jeffrey was just rude and he just gave the neighbors the creeps like everyone just avoided him no one wanted to speak to him interact with him but there was one neighbor that he particularly creeped out and this was a woman called Lois Pearson. Lois was currently in her early 50s she was born in 1949 and she had been living in the house next door to Jeffrey for her whole life and I literally mean her whole life from the moment she was born she has lived in the same house and when Lois was a child she just lived with her mother her father died when she was young and Lois is described as a pretty shy pretty reserved person she did get a job as an elementary teacher but she never really ventured very far from home as soon as she would finish work she would return back home she didn't really have any friends she didn't really have a social life and that was the way she liked her life she liked her isolated little world that she had the only time she would ever venture out of her area was when she would visit the grocery store once a month and she would go to church. She was a devout Christian and she would go to church every single Sunday. She would never miss church. And then when Lois reached her 40s, her mother sadly passed away. And when her mom passed away, she became even more independent. Like literally she would do everything herself. For example, there was one time where her pipes froze and she didn't have any running water and she refused to get anyone in to fix it. So she just lived without running water. Whenever her car was broken, she would fix it herself. And if she didn't fix it, she would just walk everywhere. Like she would walk to church, which was a 20 mile round trip. She even got rid of her TV at one point because she didn't want it anymore. I think she was a very nature person. Is that the right way to say it? She was very one with nature and she just liked walking around the fields. She had three cats. She eventually left her job as a teacher at the elementary school and she would sometimes go days without any human interaction. So people weren't really aware of Lois and what she was doing and her whereabouts. So now we get to 2001 and Jeffrey has moved into the property next door to her. So when when Jeffrey moved in, they would occasionally cross paths. They would wave to one another, say hello, a little bit of small talk. However, it wasn't long until things became weird between the two of them because Jeffrey started to ask Lois out. And when he first asked Lois out, she was really taken aback. She was like, um, no, because Lois wasn't interested in romantic relationships. She had never had a partner before. She just wasn't interested. That was not her thing. She politely declined his request because Lois was very polite to everyone. However, Jeffrey would not leave her alone. He was like, will you go out with me? Will you go out with me? Will you go out with me? And Lois kept politely declining him. And then we eventually get to 2005, which is four years after Jeffrey first moved next to Lois. And he has been asking her out constantly over those four years. And he was getting impatient because he was like, 
How dare this woman say no to me? So he pulled up onto her property, jumped out of his car, went up to Lois and tried to kiss her. Now Lois was horrified and she had had enough at this point and she immediately pulled away and she was like, what the hell are you doing? I don't want to be around you. I don't want to date you. I don't want anything to do with you. And she said to him, don't ever come back to my house again. You are not welcome. But Jeffrey was not happy about this, was he? He did leave her property, but he said to Lois, you'll regret this, Lois. Don't worry, I'll make you pay. However, not too long after this interaction, Jeffrey actually moved. Yep, he just moved out of his house, which was a huge relief to Lois because she was like, thank God, thank God that creep has gone. And following this, Lois didn't see Jeffrey for years. But sadly for Lois, things were far from over because Jeffrey was planning on keeping his promise of making her pay. So now we skip to 2011. So at this point, Jeffrey is 59 years old and Lois is in her 60s. Now, Jeffrey had obviously moved house. He had moved to another remote location. It was just outside of Corsicana in Texas. Meanwhile, Lois has gone back to living her quiet, remote, isolated life. She was living her best life. She was happy and she probably had forgotten Jeffrey because six years had passed at this point. That's a long time. Lois probably isn't thinking too much about him. However, Jeffrey definitely hadn't forgotten Lois. Oh no, for those six years, he had held a grudge against Lois. And it's so crazy when you remember that Jeffrey is holding a grudge against Lois because she said no to a date. So on the 1st of March, 2011, Jeffrey shows up at Lois's home. Now, six years have passed. Like I said, Lois probably hasn't really thought about Jeffrey too much over those six years. So when she first saw him, she was a little bit taken aback. But Lois is so polite. If that was me, I would be like, uh, get off my property. But Lois was very polite. She said hello. She gave him a wave. She gave him a smile. However, Lois noticed that Jeffrey looked different. He had almost this wild look in his eye. There was something about his eyes that were different. And before Lois could even get away, Jeffrey walks up to her and pulls out a can of pepper spray and sprays it directly in her eyes. She immediately starts screaming. She is in so much pain, but she lives in such a remote area that no one can hear her scream. She knows that this situation that she is in right now is bad and she needs to get away from Jeffrey as soon as possible. So even though she can't see, she turns the other way and starts running. But she soon runs into a barbed wire fence and she tries to get over the fence. Her hands are actually bleeding because she's trying to get over this barbed wire fence but Jeffrey soon catches up to her. Jeffrey was on top of her and he dragged her back inside her house. Once they were inside the house, Jeffrey put prison-like shackles on her ankles. But Lois is not about to go down quietly. She is not going to do what he wants. She immediately tries to make for the door to get away. But Jeffrey picks up a rolling pin and starts smashing her over the head. And her face is completely beat up. And Lois was in so much pain. But all she kept thinking about was that that rolling pin that Jeffrey was using to hit her belonged to her mother. And it almost hurt more because it belonged to her mother. And then Jeffrey started to look for some duct tape and he started to demand Lois to tell him where there is some duct tape, but Lois refuses to talk to him. So Jeffrey went into another room and he got an extension cord, which he started to cut up because he was going to use this to bind Lois's wrists. So he bound Lois's wrists and he got a butcher's knife and he said to Lois that if she makes one more move to escape, he would kill her. And then Jeffrey goes to his vehicle to retrieve some duct tape. However, Lois does not listen. She tries to 
break free. And her wrists are so small that she actually manages to slip her hands out of the electrical cord binds. And she manages to get to the door and run in the opposite direction of where Jeffrey is at his vehicle. And Lois is running as quickly as she can down the road to try and get some help. But you've got to remember that her ankles are still shackled. And Jeffrey goes back into the house with duct tape and he notices that she has gone and he sees that she is running down the road and Jeffrey is furious. He goes back to his vehicle and starts driving after her. And when Jeffrey caught up with her, he jumped out of his truck. He had a gun in his hand, which he was pointing at her and he said, right now time for plan b and honestly i do not know what his plan a was but plan b is pretty bad following this he then forced lois in the back of his truck he put handcuffs on her wrists and duct tape over her mouth lois had now been abducted by jeffrey he then drove two hours to his house in corsicana and Lois's nightmare has only just begun. Now, after the two hour drive to Jeffrey's home, Lois didn't have a clue where she was because she couldn't see anything. She was lying down in the back of the truck that whole journey. And pretty much the whole journey, Lois was just praying, praying that she would get out of this situation, praying that she would live. So now after the two hour journey, Lois found herself in a garage, which was completely unfamiliar to her. And it was so cluttered. It had various different machines, lying around. There were chains hanging from the ceiling and there was also a homemade deer skinning device, which I have never seen one of these before. So I did have to Google it. And honestly, this is terrifying because I think we all know where this is going. So the best way that I can describe what this deer skinning device looks like is that it's just kind of like a hoist on the ceiling, like attached to the ceiling. And it has two chains coming down that were attached to a metal bar. And like I said, I think we all know where this is going because Jeffrey put Lois on this deer skinning device. She was being lifted by her hands. So her arms were completely straight and just being in that position alone, literally hanging by your wrists would be so painful and Lois is dangling there she's pretty much naked she is so humiliated it's so degrading Lois had never actually been naked in front of anyone before like I said she'd never been in a relationship with anyone nothing like that she had never even been naked in front of a doctor before and Lois was just crying that is all she was doing she was just sobbing her heart out and Jeffrey just started mocking her he just started laughing at her he found it so hilarious that Lois was crying and Lois started to pray again. She started to pray and ask for guidance, for help, for safety. And Jeffrey again just started mocking her and he said to her, that after he is done with her, she would not believe in God anymore. And I need to warn you now, it starts to get really distressing this case, but it's been distressing anyway. But from here on out, bloody how it gets so intense because this is when Jeffrey sexually tortures Lois. So Lois is hanging there naked and Jeffrey just starts to put his hands all over her and feel her and just just be disgusting. It's just so creepy. And then all of a sudden, Lois started to feel something hard and pointed against her back. And then Jeffrey put this item up her rectum. And then it started to vibrate and shake inside of her. And of course, this was a sex toy, but Lois at the time didn't realize this. But from the descriptions of Lois, she was in a lot of pain. But Jeffrey didn't stop there. He had chains and whips. He had this one whip with red tassels on the end. And he just started whipping her from head to toe. And she was screaming. She was in agony. And he particularly focused on her breasts because that was the most painful. And Lois she was trying not to scream out because she didn't want to give him that satisfaction, but she was in so much pain. She couldn't help but scream out. And this lasted what felt like an eternity to Lois before Jeffrey finally lowered her to the ground. He then uncuffed her and walked her into the main house where he placed her in the bathroom and told her to clean up. And this was the first time that Lois had access to a mirror and she could actually see her injuries and she was covered in cuts and bruises and her face in particular 
was so beat up. She looks like a different person. Her one eye was so swollen. She was actually worried that she would lose it. And like I said, being hung from your wrists would be painful enough, but because Lois was hung up by her wrists for so long, she had fractured and dislocated her shoulder. She was in so much pain from head to toe. And after her shower, Jeffrey gave her some of his clothes to wear, which Lois, of course, she did because she wanted to wear clothes, but she absolutely hated wearing Jeffrey's clothes because they smelt like him. And he got into the bed next to her and went to sleep because it was bedtime. It's just unbelievable, isn't it, how these people can do something so sadistic and then just, just go to sleep. But Lois did not sleep. Oh no, of course she didn't. And what was just really sad for Lois, because this is what she was thinking about in this moment, is that this is the first time she has ever spent a night away from her home. So now we get to day two and Lois was taken out of the bedroom. Jeffrey told her that he needed to go to the store to buy more padlocks. So Lois was taken back to the garage and Lois thought that she was going to be placed back on the deer skinning device. And she was thinking, oh God, please, no, no, I cannot do this again. But Jeffrey actually showed her a new little contraption, which was essentially a coffin. And Jeffrey was laughing and he said to Lois, which one? Which one do you want to be on or in? And Lois immediately said the coffin because she could not go back on that deer skinning device being held by her wrist. I mean, her shoulder was already dislocated. Jeffrey then placed the coffin under a workbench and she doesn't know how long she was in that box for. Time wouldn't move normally in a situation like that. And Jeffrey returned home and took her out of the coffin. He then took her to the bedroom and took all of her clothes off and he began to sexually assault her. Now, Lois was a virgin and Jeffrey seemed to find this hilarious. He seemed to get even more of a kick out of the fact that she was a virgin. And after Jeffrey had raped her multiple times, Lois was in so much pain. Jeffrey then handcuffed Lois to the bed again and went to sleep again. Now, Lois, she was trying to fight sleep, but she hadn't slept in two days and she was so exhausted. Her body was so tired and Lois gave gave in to the fatigue and Lois did manage to get a few hours sleep. So now it is day three and Jeffrey again needed to go out. He apparently had a job to do and he was gonna be gone for a few hours. This time though, he handcuffed Lois to the bed and that is where he left her. And Lois was handcuffed to this bed all day. And Jeffrey did eventually return home, but because Lois was handcuffed to this bed all day, she had wet herself and Jeffrey was so angry with this he actually beat her up. Jeffrey removed the metal gag from her mouth and Lois realized that the metal gag had cracked her front teeth, which, oh my God, that alone sounds so painful. And Jeffrey, after he had returned home, he seemed to be in a very good mood. He had this creepy grin on his face and he seemed very excited. And he said to Lois, I have something to show you. And a story came on about a house fire in the local area and as Lois was watching this news story it dawned on her that the house fire was her house. That is where Jeffrey had been all day. He was burning down her house and this hurt Lois more than anything that Jeffrey had done to her so far because that was her home. That was her home since the moment she was born. It had all of her possessions in that home. Irreplaceable items were in that home like family photos and Jeffrey found this hilarious. He seems to find everything hilarious. He was just laughing his head off. He is so vindictive and evil and it's like why did he have to do this? Was he trying to cover his tracks? Was he hoping that people would think that Lois was in her home when he burnt down so no one would come looking for her? But honestly, Jeffrey burning down Lois's home was probably the best thing that he did. And we will get to that in a moment. So the days roll by and Jeffrey and Lois had fallen into this very sick and twisted daily routine where Jeffrey would sexually assault Lois in the morning. And then for the rest of the day, he left her chained up gagged or trapped in the wooden coffin. And all Lois did was pray. She never lost her faith. And as the days went by, Jeffrey seemed to get less and less 
angry. He even started to trust Lois a little bit more. He started to let her roam around the house a little bit. She wasn't chained up as often. The sexual assaults didn't stop though. Oh no, of course they didn't. Lois was sometimes allowed to eat oatmeal in the morning with him because prior to this moment, I assume she was being fed, but I don't know how often. However, she couldn't put up with the sexual assaults anymore. She didn't want to put up with them and she shouldn't have to put up with them. So Lois came up with a plan. Her mom had told her from a very young age that she had been born with a bronchitis germ. And Lois has said that that is one of the reasons why she actually never kissed a boy when she was younger, because she had been born with this bronchitis germ in her mouth. Now it's highly likely that Lois's mom told her that so she wouldn't kiss any boys because I don't think you can be born with a bronchitis germ in your mouth and pass it along, or can you? I don't know, I didn't have time to research that. However, Lois genuinely believed that she had this bronchitis germ. So the next time that Jeffrey forced himself on her and he forced Lois to kiss him, Lois pushed so much saliva from her mouth into his. And she said, ha, I've made you ill now. I was born with a bronchitis germ. You're not going to want to come near me again. And Jeffrey just laughed at her. He was like, yeah, sure, whatever. However, the next day he woke up and he was so sick. He had a fever and chills. He was so pale. He could barely get out of bed. Lois had actually made him ill. Now, I don't know how this happened because Lois obviously thinks that she has been born with this bronchitis germ. But I personally think it's more likely that Lois picked something up from the environment that she's living in. You've got to remember that she has that metal gag in her mouth most of the time. God knows where that gag has been. Jeffrey doesn't strike me as a very sanitary person. He probably doesn't clean his equipment or himself, to be honest. Her body is also so weak from everything that she is going through. So she's probably more susceptible to picking up an illness. So I personally think that Lois was probably ill to begin with. And then she has also just made Jeffrey ill because Jeffrey was ill for a few days. So more days roll by. And as the days roll by, he started to trust Lois a little bit more. He kept her chained up less and he stopped sexually assaulting her as much. He really was scared of her bronchitis germ. However, he was still just as creepy because there were times where he would force Lois to sit on his lap and watch TV, which Lois did. She never complained about anything because she wanted to keep Jeffrey in a good mood. And also when he was in a better mood, he let Lois roam around the house more freely. And Lois asked if Jeffrey had a Bible that she could read. And Jeffrey pulled out a Bible that had been one of his parents. And that is how Lois spent most of her days reading the Bible. And every so often, Jeffrey would just point at her and laugh at her and say, do you still believe in God? Have I not done enough to you already to not believe in God? Jeffrey seems to be very focused on religion, on God, on making people not believe in God. Now, I don't know if this has something to do with his very strict religious upbringing, but if you may notice a pattern, the women that he chooses are very religious. You've got to remember Martha was a devout Catholic Catholic. Now Lois is a devout Christian. He does seem to have a little bit of a victim profile and Lois started to plead with Jeffrey to take her home. She promised him that she wouldn't tell anyone about what has gone on. But Jeffrey was like, no, mm -mm, no. Jeffrey actually said that he couldn't take Lois home because somebody else was paying him to do this. And this is when it dawned on me that this case is so much like Cameron Hooker. Because do you remember that Cameron Hooker tried to convince Colleen that the company had hired him to do this? Well, Jeffrey is trying to do the same thing. He is trying to convince Lois that somebody else is paying him to do all of this. Jeffrey, even at one point said, can they get married? Yeah, he wants to marry Lois. But the only reason why he wants to marry Lois is so Lois couldn't testify against against him in court. And then finally, a few more days pass and Jeffrey needs to go to the store to buy some more groceries, but he wants Lois to pay for it. So when Jeffrey had gone back to burn down Lois's home, he picked up her purse and her checkbook, her wallet, everything. And he forced Lois to write him a $500 check. However, Jeffrey thought that he was being really intelligent with this whole check situation because he didn't want the check to lead back to him. So he forced Lois to date the check 
the 2nd of February, which was about a month before she went missing. And Jeffrey thought that he was being so intelligent with this. He thought that this check would never ever lead back to him. And if it did, well, the check was dated a month before she went missing. Jeffrey has nothing to do with it. However, this is when things start to fall down around Jeffrey Maxwell. Because do you remember I said that him burning down Lois's home was probably the best thing that he ever did? Well, now we get to that. Because when police searched Lois's burnt down home looking for her, they never found her. They never found a body. They even had cadaver dogs go out to the property, but no body, no trace of human was found in the burnt down home. So the police knew that Lois was now a missing person. So if Jeffrey had never burnt down her home, no one may have known that Lois was a missing person. So when Jeffrey went to cash that check, Lois's bank was obviously aware that she was missing. The bank phoned the police and say, um, there is a check that has been cashed from Lois's account. And this is when the police get notified of a name, Jeffrey Maxwell. And they look into Jeffrey and they see his history. They see that his wife has gone missing. They see that he also attempted to murder his wife prior to this. And they think, okay, mm -hmm, Jeffrey is someone that we need to look into. So now we get to Saturday, the 12th of March, 2011. This is 12 days after the abduction. Lois has been in those conditions, being sexually tortured every single day for 12 days. So on this day, Jeffrey was just watching TV. Lois was sat on the floor reading the Bible when there was a loud knock on the door. Jeffrey tried to ignore the knock because he was antisocial. He wasn't going to answer the door. However, they knocked again. So eventually Jeffrey thought to himself, I'm going to have to answer this door. So Jeffrey turned to Lois and said, if you move or make a sound, I'll kill you. And when Jeffrey opened the door, oh my God, I would have loved to have seen his face because he opened the door to two police officers. And they start asking him, do you know a Lois Pearson? And Jeffrey again tried to act dumb. Oh yeah, yeah, I know her. She used to be my neighbor a long time ago. And the police were like, well, we're questioning anyone that knew her or maybe has been in the area of where she lived recently. And Jeffrey was like, well, I haven't been by her home. I haven't been anywhere near her. And as this conversation is going on, Lois is in the other room listening and she is thinking, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? She doesn't know what to do because she knows that Jeffrey, he always carries a gun with him. He is also very unpredictable. So she doesn't know what to do. Lois also looks out of the window and sees that there is a car that says sheriff on the side. So she knows that these two people at the door are police officers. And she makes her mind up. She's like, this is my one opportunity to escape. And she runs through the house. She runs through the front door into the officers and start shouting, I'm here, I'm here. Now the officers were absolutely stunned. And the first thing the officers say to Lois is, who are you? They didn't realize that the woman that has literally just ran into them was Lois Pearson, the woman that they are looking for because she looks so different. She has barely been fed. She is covered in bruises and cuts. And I have seen photos of Lois when she is saved and she does look like a completely different person. And this is when the officers force Jeffrey up against the wall and he is finally arrested and Lois is actually being saved. And when the officers search the house, they find an assortment of sex toys. Sex toys that had blood all over them. They also found a loaded pistol, handcuffs, shackles, and of course they found the coffin and the deer skinning device. A bottle of lube on the side, and they also found his very disturbing collection of sex slave fetish movies and magazines. And I cannot even imagine what this place would have looked like. I just, oh God, it really does send shivers down your spine. Lois was immediately rushed to hospital because she was in a really bad state. And on the photos that I've seen, you can see her shoulder. It's completely out of place. And it is crazy when you think that she was 
living with a dislocated shoulder for 12 days. And now Jeffrey Maxwell is taken to the police station to be interviewed. And Jeffrey actually is pretty forthcoming in his interview. He doesn't try and hide anything. He knows that the game is up. And he starts telling the police everything about how all of this was his fantasy. Are, are these things that that you were wanting to, to try on somebody? I mean, oh, yes, a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of everything. I mean, he had sex slave porn in his house. So yeah, this was literally his fantasy. He told the officers that he had always wanted a sex slave and he had gotten one with Lois. He also said that once he had gotten himself into this situation, he didn't know how to get out of it. He didn't actually know what to do. He was in over his head. So that is when he came up with the plan on marrying Lois. And that was going to be his get out of jail free card. What was going through your mind? How, how was you, I mean, you had to have been thinking about some way you're going to get out of this. What was he talking about getting married? You was talking about getting married? Yeah. To kind of make it look. Well, if it's married, she figured she, 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 she couldn't be forced to testify against me. And personally, I think that Jeffrey in that moment probably decided that the only way out of this situation was to kill Lois. And after three days of interrogation, Jeffrey Maxwell was charged with aggravated kidnapping and two counts of aggravated sexual assault. And he was held in jail awaiting trial. So then we get to the 14th of February, 2012, which is when Jeffrey's trial finally went ahead. Now, even though he had been pretty forthcoming and admitted everything, he still pleaded not guilty. But the prosecution had so much evidence. There was so much evidence in his home of the devices and the sex toys. They also played the taped confession that Jeffrey made after his arrest. Prosecution also brought character witnesses to testify against Jeffrey. And these character witnesses were Rita's best friend, the woman that he raped two days before his wedding. Also Rita's two young daughters that were sexually assaulted by Jeffrey also took the stand to testify. Unfortunately, he wasn't being charged with what he did to those three people, but they took the stand, they were brave and they testified. And finally, the most damning testimony was from Lois. Lois, who was so scared about taking the stand, but she was brave and she knew that she had to do it to make sure that Jeffrey went to prison and would never be released. She talked about the pain that she suffered during her abduction, but also the pain that she was still in. She was still struggling with her shoulder. Even though it had been fixed, she was still in pain. She also had permanent ligament damage to her fingers. And she also talked about her three cats because Jeffrey burnt down her house with her three cats inside. I know, I know. I just, I can't believe this man. It only took the jury one hour to decide that Jeffrey Maxwell was guilty on all three charges. And he was sentenced to three life sentences in prison and he was taken away in shackles. And finally, this man has been stopped. However, has justice been served in this case? Well, maybe for Lois, but I'm not so sure that justice has been completely served in this case because now we need to revisit Martha. She went missing in 1992, which by this point was 20 years ago, and she still hasn't been found. To this day, no one knows where Martha Martinez is. It still remains a cold case, and it is highly likely that Jeffrey has murdered Martha. And even after Jeffrey was arrested for what he did to Lois and then linked to the disappearance of his wife, investigators did look into this, but there was no evidence to link him to the disappearance or the murder of Martha. And this is so incredibly tragic that Martha's family have had no closure. They don't know where she is. Martha's son has lost his mother. He doesn't know where his mom is, what happened to her. But Martha is not the only possible murder that Jeffrey is responsible for. Because remember in the intro, I said that Jeffrey is possibly a serial killer. Because we now need to talk about Amelia Smith. She went missing in Weatherford, Texas in 2000. And Weatherford was not too far away from where Jeffrey was living at the time. Amelia disappeared and her house was burned down. Sound familiar? And at the time, Amelia had no link to Jeffrey. So police didn't even look into Jeffrey when Amelia disappeared. But now, all of these years later, the police strongly suspect that Jeffrey had something to do with Amelia's disappearance and possible murder. Amelia was also 
deeply religious, which is Jeffrey's victimology. However, there is one more cold case that Jeffrey has been linked to. In 2010, a woman called Shonda Townsend went missing and a year later her remains were found. A homicide investigation was launched. However, this is also a cold case to this very day. Shonda was also deeply religious. Now at the time of his arrest, Jeffrey was questioned about this murder as well. But again, there is not enough evidence to link him to the murder of Shonda. So those are three potential murder victims of Jeffrey Maxwell and who knows if if there are more. And of course, I will leave links in the description box down below on all of the information on Martha, Amelia, and Shonda, because these are cold cases. So it would mean a lot if you could take the time to look at the description box and go to those links. And let's just spread the word about these cases. There's no words for someone like Jeffrey. He is so evil and sadistic, and there is a special place waiting for him. And this case is kind of bittersweet because I'm very thankful that Lois survived this because this is a survivor story but then there are three other potential murder victims. And Lois is now in her early 70s and she slowly had to rebuild her life. The church that she attended actually raised $17,000 for her to buy a new trailer for her land. And what is actually really heartwarming to hear about is that Lois, after the ordeal that she went through, she's actually become more involved in her community. And Lois has actually said that before all of this before she went through this ordeal, she never realized how much she liked people because now she has friends, she has a community, people check on her and she's actually started to build confidence. She now sings and plays the piano at church, which is something that she never did before. And I'm just so happy for Lois. I'm so happy that she has a community around her and I'm so happy that she was able to rebuild her life. And that is the end of today's case. Don't forget to check out those links in my description box. Let's try and spread the word about those three cold cases. And as always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below because I always wanna know what you wanna hear next. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.